and they left off to build the city. Therefore they name it Babel. Genesis. 11. 8-9. What happened to Nimrod's Babylon? The religion, pushed by Cush and Nimrod, marked the beginning of pagan polytheism in the post-flood world, the worship of many gods. The snake, sun, and fire became their symbols of the pagan god on earth. Human sacrifice became openly practiced. Even though God wanted his people to spread out, and only serve him, Nimrod, through this empire and religion of Babylon, began to unite the people, all under his one world government. As a result, this early Babylonian religion began to be abhorred by pious, God-following generations of their era. One of them, Noah's son Shem, decided to do something about it. According to tradition, Shem gathered 72 co-conspirators to help him, and some made their way up to the palace where Nimrod lived. After catching him in a double cross, Shem killed Nimrod, and cut his body into little pieces. He alerted his co-conspirators, each one of them, to take a piece of Nimrod's body and distribute it to all the cities under his rule. They did as they were told, but, all of this gore had a purpose, however, to show the world, proof positively, that Nimrod wasn't a god. It was Shem's warning to all of Nimrod's new followers, stop what they were doing and start obeying God, or else. Nimrod's followers did become very frightened, they worshipped him as a god, a god of whom they thought would live forever. Now, he was dead, the validity of their newfound religion was in question. Cush, his father, was already shamed for his previous actions at the tower. He wasn't really able to unite the people under these systems as Nimrod did. Their whole ability to control the populace had to go a little less out in the open. The way they maintained their power would be accomplished, in part, by another up-and-coming character, a woman. Rarely known by her proper name, Semiramis was to be exalted into one of the most famous women since the flood. She was Cush's wife at the time of the tower, and also the mother of Nimrod. After Cush was disgraced, subtle Semiramis didn't want to go down with him. So, to maintain her reputation, she did the unthinkable, she married her own son. By marrying Nimrod, Semiramis could still maintain somewhat of authority over the populace, as long as her husband remained in charge. Once Nimrod was murdered, however, Semiramis was, again, in danger of losing all that she had. It just happened that, right around this time, Semiramis was pregnant, the father supposedly unknown. Yet, this was her golden opportunity to capitalize on those looking for answers. We will see that, from Cain, seed of the serpent, there was a famous prophecy, given by God, to Adam and Eve, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy, the serpent's, seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15, King James Version. This prophecy was also well known to the people of Noah's post-flood era. It stated simply that, one day, a savior would be born, a savior who would arise from the seed of Eve. This savior would bruise the head of the serpent, and his seed, in order to save humanity from their worldly sins. Semiramis believed that if she could convince the world that her unborn son was the one who would indeed, save the world, she might still retain all of her power. What if her unborn child was, the promised seed, the one destined to, crush the serpent's head, able to remove the curse of sin and death which began in the garden? This would, practically, launch him into a godlike state in his own right. Her unborn child, according to Semiramis, would become just that, none other than Nimrod reborn. According to her, Nimrod reincarnated himself in her womb. Semiramis slept with no man, in this case, and became pregnant by his Holy Spirit. Doesn't this all sound familiar? In the end, this slaughter of Nimrod was actually a good thing. He now became a martyr. It would be Nimrod who died for the sins of the entire world, and rose again as this child. Semiramis, naturally, would have to be looked upon as a great mother, or even virgin mother, of this new, wonderful, faith. Surely, it's beginning to sound very familiar. Yes, this was the greatest twist in the history of the world, the twist of Jesus Christ. Now, this theft of God's prophecy would rob millions of what would be the true savior of the world, Jesus himself. The people now began to preemptively accept Nimrod as the fulfillment of this great prophecy. His death would be what saved everyone from the curse of the garden. Semiramis, naturally, would also have to become deified, as the mother of the child. Interestingly enough, many of the images the people made of her, since then, looked like this. Now, this image of mother and child, 2000 years before the actual birth of Christ, became the new object of veneration and worship. Ultimately, this system of ancient Babylonian religion was saved by them borrowing of God's prophecy, and twisting it all around. Over time, Nimrod became considered the pagan, horned god. 
Semiramis the goddess, Semiramis, once again, had managed to halt the attempt of Shem and his godly conspirators to stop the progress of a Babylonian system of religion. She, as well, managed to explain away the doubt and confusion steeped in the minds of Nimrod's believers. Nimrod, pagan god of the old system, didn't really die. He was reincarnated into another god for the people. The Babylonian religion before Semiramis might have seemed harsh to some. Now, in order to make her new systems of religion look a little more pure and wholesome, there had to be a few changes. No longer would some of their graphic practices be openly practiced, such as human sacrifice. A lot of it had to either go under cover for a while, until it was safe to bring it out in the open, again, or it needed to be made to look a little more wholesome. Systems need to be changed. Why? It was to make sure that no one of God, like Shem, would be able to go to such a high level again, and almost devastate their entire belief structure. These ancient Babylonian belief systems, knowledge, and ways of life to be ingrained into forthcoming cultures, politics, and religious beliefs, would have to be carefully and subtly molded and assimilated into each new empire succeeding Babylon. To the pagans, God was still their enemy. His ways were not their ways. Their own thought became the measure of all things, not all of them. The two avenues of belief have been at odds with each other, ever since the beginning. The rise of the Israeli nation, as well as Christianity, would both work to push much of the old, harsher facets of this old Babylonian religion under cover, but they would not die. All of these different systems, or facets, of culture, politics, and religion, that didn't exactly come from Allah, came from somewhere. It is these, other, ways of looking at things, according to the Bible, which could be amassed, collectively, into one sinister mystery Babylon. What would happen after the adoption of Semiramis' new belief systems could be found in the legacy of Nimrod. This video gives you details on how some aspects of Mystery Babylon could even have been adopted by one of Shem's descendants, and made it to work for evil. For more on the ancient background of Babylon, from the beginning, all the way up the time leading up to Cush and Nimrod, please subscribe so you can see the gap theory.